I have here is the EVO 64, that's short for Evolution 64. I tend to think of this board as coming from an alternate universe, where Commodore was known for making super high quality over engineered systems instead of inexpensive computers for the masses. Now this is an expensive board, uh, designed to give the best quality audio and video. Of course it doesn't come with any of the original C64 chips, you'll have to supply those yourself. Now Parafractic recently did a video on this board where he substituted all modern components, so you can in theory build a C64 with all modern parts, but that's not what I'm going to do here. It has two SID sockets and can take either kind of SID chip, uh, I'll have to see if I can find a second SID. Check out these ZIF sockets, I've never seen anything like this before, I'm just mesmerized at how these open and close so elegantly. Um, oddly enough, for whatever reason, the ROM socket is a more traditional ZIF socket. Also, this ROM apparently has a number of other things on it that uh, we'll have to have a look at. I noticed it does have a built-in PLA, so you won't need one of those, and the video circuit is supposed to be much cleaner than the original and hopefully shouldn't generate jail bars. I also noticed that there's no RF modulator on this board. In its place, we find this new tube 64, which is a vacuum tube based amplifier for the SID chips. And uh, I think this stereo output jack will probably line up exactly with the channel select hole on the C64 case. The tube is made by Korg, and uh, my first thought upon seeing this is that it looks like a vacuum fluorescent display, and I think that's the basic technology behind it. Underneath the new tube, you'll find jumpers to select between the onboard traditional transistor amplifier or the new tube. Uh, we'll experiment with these later and see if we can tell the difference. So the plan is, I want to put this board in my bread bin. Uh, believe it or not, this computer already has better video quality than most of my other Commodore systems. So if this one is considered one of the best, then it's going to be tough for the Evo to outperform this. But in order to quantify that, uh, what I need to do is connect this to a video capture device so I can have some baseline comparisons. I'll use my old Dazzle DC90, which is a, uh, about 20 years old at this point, but uh, it actually does better capture from composite RS video than anything else I have around here. Unfortunately, that also means uh, I have to use a really old computer for compatibility. Now, I just need to adjust some of the levels and, uh, okay, looks good. I'll use my Zoom H4n to capture some audio so we can uh, later compare that as well. But for some reason, I couldn't seem to get a signal to the device, just background noise. And at first I thought something was wrong with the wiring, but uh, then I remembered that I had taken the SID chip to repair my SX64 a while back. So. That's why I have no audio, so I went up in the attic and dug out um, one last C64 that had been up there for a decade or so, and I was pretty sure it didn't work, so I plugged it in just to check, and yep, the uh, I think the PLA or RAM is bad. Anyway, I opened it up, and at least it has a SID chip. In fact, uh, I kind of lucked out here because the SID chip was literally the only chip that was in a socket. So now I'll just have to stick this into my working bread bin and cross my fingers. Hey, I think it works. So I started by capturing just an ordinary basic screen, and then I played some Gianna Sisters. Uh, by the way, this is a new NTSC fixed version. Uh, most of my life I played a PAL version that flickered a lot when scrolling. I played some Petsky Robots, and I have a very specific reason for picking this since I used a lot of single pixel graphics which can look really bad on some C64s, and I wanted to see how that compared. No test would be complete without some Ultima. Okay, now that I have my captures, time to start building the EVO 64. After I install the VIC-2 chip, I'll set the voltage. This board can use either kind. Next, I'll do the SID chip. Uh, likewise, this board can use either kind, so I'll have to set the voltage and a few other things. And before I go much further, uh, I want to test it for life. And nothing. I spent about an hour trying to figure out what the problem was, and while measuring the voltages, I noticed that uh, on the VIC-2 chip I was reading negative 5 volts, and I thought, that can't be right. Um, that's when I realized the chip was in backwards. Now I have to at least partially blame the board design for this. Uh, you see these ZIF sockets are not labeled with a notch or anything to tell you which direction the chip goes. 
and the install guide also didn't mention anything about it, but it did have this photo, and I briefly looked at these chips at the top and thought, oh, look, the uh, notch faces the direction of the release lever. No problem. Unfortunately, that was not consistent across the board. I have since spoken with the designers and they have acknowledged that there might be an issue with the documentation, so they have promised to rework that just a little bit before the final retail release, which should prevent this issue in the future. Okay, so what we need to do now is uh, rotate this chip around and try it again. And luckily, it works. I say luckily because I was concerned I might have damaged the chip. I guess it's time to mount this thing in the bread bin case. I need to remove this side plate here so I can transfer that over to the new board. Unfortunately, I realized it wouldn't fit because uh, they have these standoffs on the joystick boards that were in the way. So I took those off uh, only to realize they were holding the socket together, so that's annoying. Fortunately, I managed to find some screws of the right size and threads and uh, those will hold it together. Here's a comparison so you can see how far the standoffs protrude versus the screws. And believe it or not, there's plenty of room for the screws without them getting in the way. But uh, then I ran into another problem. Uh, this screw hole here, uh, which holds the bracket on, is too small and my screw wouldn't fit. So I had to drill the hole slightly larger. That seemed to work fine. So uh, now I have a properly mounted bracket. Well, let's see how this thing goes into the case. Man, there we go. I'm pretty satisfied with that. So the first thing I wanted to do was take a screen capture of BASIC uh, to compare, and honestly, I was a bit skeptical if there would be any improvement. Um, so this is the original, and um, let's look at the new capture. Now I have no idea why the files on the SD card have moved around in the directory, but uh, well, to my surprise, I have to admit the video is sharper. Um, let's zoom in a bit and compare. Now, there's a lot of JPEG compression noise around the text, which comes from my video capture device, and there's nothing I can do about that. But uh, just look at the text itself. Um, there is clearly a difference between these. And uh, like I said before, my bread bin had one of the better pictures, so imagine comparing this with one of the worst. Actually, we don't have to imagine. I'll connect up my Commodore 128 and have a look. Uh, let's put it in uh, C64 mode so we get a better comparison. Now, I did have to turn the brightness down in the capture device on this one because the text was blooming some, so uh, I tried adjusting the capture device on the Evo 64 similarly. Uh, the 128 outputs a slightly shrunken picture for some reason, and uh, overall the contrast and sharpness of the C128 is pretty good actually, uh, but the big problem is that it has jail bars. And now for those that don't know what that means, uh, imagine jail bars for the moment. <laughs> They're vertical bars, right? Well, you can see a faint pattern in the background here with vertical stripes. Uh, my Breadbin 64 had them too, but uh, they were much less noticeable. So, here's Gianna Sisters, and uh, well, um, I hate to say it, but I can't see any real difference here other than the blue background has less noise and jail bars, but uh, that's not surprising because this game runs in multicolor modes, so the pixels are larger. And um, I think where we'll see the bigger difference is in Petsky Robots. Ah, yes, uh, this is much clearer where I have the single pixels or alternating pixel patterns. Um, yes, indeed, I can see a significant difference in clarity here, especially if you zoom in. But uh, forget about capture devices for a moment. How does it look on a real monitor? Well, uh, with my Samsung TV, I couldn't really tell much difference, but uh, with my Commodore 1084, I could tell right away. Um, <laughs> I know this will never come out on video as clearly as I can see it in person, so the best way I can describe this is that it looks fake. I mean, it's like somebody connected an emulator up to my monitor instead of a real C64. Um, heck, uh, looking at Petsky Robots and those single pixels and alternating pixels, they are super clear. In fact, uh, they're sharper here than on the video capture device, which is quite surprising. Although, um, you might notice that my sprites are sparkling sometimes, and this could be a result of bad RAM, which is not likely on this machine since the RAM is part of the PCB using modern chips. The more likely explanation is that my VIC-2 chip is the Revision 56A, uh, which is known to have a sparkle bug, so uh, maybe I need to find a different VIC-2 chip for this. I think it's safe to say that the video quality is much improved, and that's not just an opinion, that's something that's quantifiable in these experiments. 
And uh, if the improved video quality is all that you care about, well, you know, then you could buy just the uh, Evo 64 board uh, by itself for uh, just a little bit under $300. You know, which is not terrible considering the improved quality that you'll get and most likely improved reliability as well. Um, also, you do get the dual SID option. Now, there are, of course, other um, options out there. In fact, I actually have uh, this guy here, the uh, C128neo. Uh, for example, that's been sitting on my shelf for about a year that I, I haven't done anything with. This is, But this is for the Commodore 128, but it's, it's the same kind of idea. And there are some other ones for the C64 as well. But anyway, let's move along and see if the new tube, which is a $500 upgrade, uh, can also be justified in some way. Uh, by the way, just like regular vacuum tube, these things do light up when you power them on. The effect is a bit hard to see on camera, so uh, I'll turn the lights out. There we go. So uh, obviously, I recorded a few things on the original C64, and now what I need to do is compare those with the recordings from the new tube. Uh, so what I've done is connected my zoom recorder directly to the audio output on the new tube, and then recorded the Gianna Sisters intro theme. And uh, now what I've done is brought both copies into Audacity to compare. Now the top here is the original standard recording from my C64 before I started the whole project. And then the bottom is from the new tube. And I've lined them up perfectly so that you could actually play both together if you wanted. Now, one interesting thing is if you zoom in on the waveform, you may notice that they are inverted, uh, completely opposite of each other for some reason. Uh, but the real test is to listen to them. So what I'll do is I'll play a bit here and then I'll switch back and forth and see if you can hear the difference. different part of the song. Okay, so honestly, I'm just not personally hearing any difference, but uh, then there's a part of this that may be invalid. Uh, for example, it's not too different from the age-old battle of which sounds better, vinyl records or computerized digital audio. Personally, I like vinyl, but honestly, I do not think that it sounds better, uh, especially being that the data used to record the audio comes from a digital source to begin with. Um, that being said, uh, even if I thought it did sound better, the problem is how to demonstrate that over this medium. Because you see, if I record from a vinyl record and then capture that as a compressed digital audio so that it can go over the internet and eventually to your ear, I've essentially invalidated the test. Uh, likewise, uh, the audio from the tube will have to be captured and converted by transistors and, of course, compressed before eventually being decompressed and played back on transistor equipment before you can hear it. Ideally, you'd want to use tubes all the way to the speakers in order to get the supposed improvement in sound. And even when I've played back the audio on my 1084 monitor's internal speaker, Technically, the amplifier inside the monitor is also transistor-based, so I really don't have any way to test this completely. That being said, I'm trying to keep an open mind about this, but my gut feeling is that a lot of this is just pseudoscience. Ultimately, I'll have to let you be the judge and, and see what you think, but there is one thing I can say for sure. Even if it does sound better, it certainly doesn't sound $500 better. So what we need to do now is try out the dual SID configuration. And I managed to borrow another SID chip from a friend, so uh, I'll put that in there. And uh, while I'm at it, I also borrowed a slightly more modern VIC-2 chip so uh, I could get rid of that sprite flicker. And that did, in fact, solve that problem. So now I'll try out a few of these dual SID demos. Now, obviously, there's no way to compare this with the original C64 since it only had one SID chip. Still, it's pretty cool to listen to these. Well, what is my final opinion? Well, I think if all you cared about was the board, the main board, which is, you know, under 300 bucks, and, uh, you know, you're going to get the better reliability and uh, the better video quality and the dual SID option, 
it's not a, a terrible uh, it's not a terrible price. I think it's it's probably well worth it, especially if you have a C64 that you either can't figure out what's wrong with it, uh, or the board is just unrepairable for whatever reason. Uh, it's a good replacement option as well. But I don't personally think I could recommend the new tube option, at least at the price they're selling it, unless you are an extreme audiophile. So a big thanks to the Evolution guys for sending this for me to review. Uh, but uh, that's about it for this episode. So as always, thanks for watching.